Good morning, everybody. I'm Debbie Lynn Toomey, Tufts Medical Center's Injury Prevention Coordinator. And I'm so happy to be able to share with you Stop the Bleed, which is a national campaign to really teach the lay people, people out in the communities, how to recognize life-threatening bleed. So that way, hopefully, should there be an incident at your back door or grocery stores, you just never know these days, right, that you know what to do whether it's for you to get out of there and then maybe call 911 after when you're safe, or if it is safe for you to help the people around you, okay? Because we can bleed to death in minutes. We bleed to death in minutes, and that's why seconds count. And that's why bystanders who are trained and stop the bleed, they matter. You can save people's lives. Okay, so as we know, the world out there has been, uh, it's been a very complicated and complex world out there. And the more prepared we are, the better. And this training is not meant to scare anybody. If anything, it's meant to empower you so that when something does happen, you know in the back of your mind, this is what I learned, ABCs, okay? Thank you. So Stop the Bleed is the course. And uh, for those of you out there who are watching this in the, on TV, just know that you will get the basic idea of what this program is about. But in order for you to get the full training, you need to be able to watch me during a presentation or go online. And there's an online um, training. Well, actually, an online training that just talks about uh, what Stop the Bleed is. But in order to complete the actual certification, you need to still go to a place and practice how to pack the wound, use a tourniquet, and be able to just really know what type of, um, what type of gauze or what type of materials you could use to help absorb these bleeding, uh, the blood. So. Here, Stop the Bleed happened because of this incident, 2012. Okay, basically this was the straw that broke the camel's back. Prior to this, there were other school shootings, unfortunately, in colleges, universities, but this one here broke the camel's back because what they did was something fabulous, actually. They, the people who were at the scene and the doctors and their surgeons, they basically, they looked at what the situation was and they determined that many of the victims, there were a lot of students that were killed, there were teachers that were killed. The shooter himself killed his mother and then killed himself. But from research, they discovered that many of the, shoot, the victims who were shot, their lives could have been saved had the bystanders there knew how to stop their bleeding. And so this happened in December. A few months later in the springtime, many governing bodies came together to figure out how they can create a program that they could teach out into the into the public, similar to CPR. Anybody here trained in CPR? Very good. So here are the governing bodies that came together. The American College of Surgeon Committee on Trauma, the American College of Emergency Physicians, the National Association of Emergency Medical Techn Technicians, and the Committee on Tactical Combat Casualty Care. So they pulled in the military to figure out, okay, because the military, they're very well trained on how to take care of themselves and their buddies when they're in that situation. 
So Stop the Bleed was carefully crafted out so that way they can create a program such as what you're going to listen to right now and be able to know the gist of it. So some of the images can be disturbing, but I, let me assure you, this is the second version of the presentation. So there's really no real blood. It's fake blood. Okay, so it's fake blood. And so, for, but still, just the thought of blood can make people a little queasy, so just we respect that. All right, so why do we need this training? Uh, because the number one cause of preventable death after an injury is bleeding. Is bleeding. Okay, so again, we bleed to death in minutes, seconds count. Where can I use this training? Well, basically, anywhere. You could use it at home for those weekend warriors or people who like to do a lot of fixing up. Accidents can happen. It can happen at home. It can happen, unfortunately, in the schools, right? Remember the Sandy Hook shootings. It can happen because somebody just wanted to harm people. It can happen because of weather-related conditions. High winds, tornadoes, hurricanes, you just never know. Will there be something flying at you? Will there be a tree, big tree limb falling at you? You just never know. It could be maybe on the way to the Cape or New Hampshire or down the pike. It could happen in the roadways. You could see there's a lot of motor vehicle accidents out there. So it could happen then. It can happen at work. One of the organizations that I do this training for is MassDOT. And before COVID, we were really doing, um, offering a lot of programs, especially for the new hires, because especially for the heavy rails people who worked with the heavy rails, they have a lot of crush injuries. So they need to know how to take care of that. So basically it could happen anywhere. It can even happen while you're vacationing swimming. One of our patients was a shark bite victim and he was very lucky. The bite was just millimeters away from his femoral artery but luckily he was able to punch the shark really hard and be able to crawl up to the sandy beach of the Cape. And Luckily, there were nurses out there who were vacationing also. They knew what to do. They stuffed the bleeding with, yeah, sandy, oily towels. They stuffed it, stuffed it, and tightened it. They called EMT. EMT came. They stuffed it even more. They applied tourniquets. They med flighted that person to Tufts Medical Center, where that person now is alive. But he had to go through many surgeries, many, many surgeries. So it can happen anywhere, anytime. Does anybody have any questions so far? And again, it's not meant to scare you. As we get older, we have medical conditions. Sometimes we're on medications for stroke or heart attack, and we're on blood thinners. So that can also be a risk factor for if you cut yourself, bad scratch. You could bleed profusely. So I'm so glad there's so many people here from the center who's attending the program because medications that we're on can put us at risk for life-threatening bleed. So the goals, very simple. Identify and recognize life-threatening bleed. And stop it. <laughs> know what to look for. Do something about it. Okay, so recognize life-threatening bleed and then take steps to stop the bleeding. And that's basically applying pressure. Packing, which is a different form of pressure. Applying tourniquet, which is also a different type of pressure. So just think pressure, okay? It's almost like, you know, does anybody garden here? Any gardeners? What happens when you have your hose hooked up and you have a a broken piece in your hose. Do you have water squirting out like that uncontrollably? That's what can happen.
to us, depending on where we are cut and how deep it is. It could squirt. If a femoral artery was cut, it's going to squirt, just like that hose with a leak. Yeah, and that's why we could bleed to death in minutes. So before I teach you how to save others, it's very important to save yourself. Personal safety matters because you don't want to be another victim. Your safety matters. So it's your priority. If you're injured, we can't help you, right? Help others only when it's safe to do so. If the situation changes or become, becomes unsafe, stop what you're doing, move to safety, and if you can, if there's a victim that's on the ground, it seems like that, that maybe they could help themselves up a little bit, help that person out as well. So safety first, okay? Another form of safety is wearing gloves. Wear gloves. If you get blood on you, even though you have gloves or maybe you decided to help it, but you, you just didn't think to wear gloves or maybe you didn't have gloves and you decided to help, just clean that body part with warm, soapy water. Keep cleaning it, keep cleaning it, keep cleaning it, saying happy birthday three or four times. <laughs> just really clean your hand or that part that got the blood spill. Okay, the hand sanitary gel, that's not really going to help with the blood too much. But if that's the only thing that you have, yeah, definitely use it. But as soon as you can get to a sink, wash yourself really well. And also let other people know, let the EMS person know, let your healthcare provider know that you got a blood spill, okay? Any questions so far? So here, again, remember the committees that came together. They're thinking about, okay, how can we teach a program that's going to be simple enough for the bystanders to remember? That's almost, almost like a CPR. So this is what they came up with. For those of you trained in CPR, do you remember the ABCs of CPR? No. <laughs> You're supposed to say yes. <laughs> Airway, <laughs> airway is for, okay, we're talking CPR here, okay, CPR hatch. A is for airway, B is breath, breath. breathing, C is, that's right. Okay, so I'm taking off the CPR hat now, I'm putting on stop the bleed hat. So to stop the bleed, A is for alert 911. I mean, these are basically, you would do these anyways, right? If there's an emergency, if it's beyond your control, You'd call 911. That's a no-brainer. So A is for alert 911. B is for bleeding. Recognize life-threatening bleed. Here's my hand. I, I created a hand. This is my homemade hand. This is not a life-threatening bleed. A band-aid, a paper cut, a boo-boo. That is not a life-threatening bleed. This could be a life-threatening bleed though, right? You like my hand? <laughs> During COVID, I taught a high school kids in um, Carver. Um, and we had to do it online because we couldn't do it any in-person. So we all had to make our own hands just so that they could learn the proper mechanics and what to do. So there, A, B, C, compression. Remember, compression basically is pressure, right? So A, alert 911. Call 911, know your location, and follow instructions provided by the 911 operator. Has anybody here ever had to call 911? And for those of you who have had to call 911, it's not a peaceful time, is it? 
It's not like one of those happy, happy, joy, joy time, right? You're calling 911 because you need help fast. And it's a scary time. For me, at least, when I called 911, I'm a trained nurse. I've been a nurse for over 30 years. But when I call 911, it still it makes me really nervous and stressed. And it, thank goodness for the well-trained 911 operators because they're just so calming. They're so grounding. They'll ask you questions. And before you know it, and luckily because of where we live, EMS is on their way within minutes. It's different if we lived in different parts of the country. So now, so that was A. Any questions with A before we go with B? No, okay. So B is bleeding. So this is the extent of the blood that you would see. It's fake blood. This is the extent of the bleeding that you'd see in this presentation, just letting you know. For those of you who are a little nervous, so bleeding, find the source of bleeding. Look for continuous bleeding. Remember that garden hose that has that broken piece and it's water is being wasted. Continuous bleeding, large volume of bleeding. Okay, almost like, you know, have you ever dropped a gallon of milk on the floor? Kind of like that, but it's red blood. Pool, large volume of bleeding and of the pooling of blood, okay? That means the pooling of blood, that means your body cannot take care of the bleeding situation. Our body is so beautiful, it's made to take care of itself. It's made to help us survive. But if we have a life-threatening bleed, that's beyond our body's control to try to control it. Because remember the paper cut? What does, what does our body do when we have a little cut? It scabs, it heals itself, right? After a while, it stops bleeding. That's our body. It's trying to help us stay alive. But if we have a big gash, that's beyond our body's ability to take care or contain that bleeding. And that's what makes it life-threatening. So there's, there could be multiple places the victim is bleeding. So the shark bite victim, that's pretty obvious. That's where the source of bleeding is. But for the people in the Boston Marathon, the bomb went. It, unfortunately, it was very low, so there's a lot of kids that were near the area. Um, and a lot of people, adults, they, had to, they lost their legs. But you could have multiple sources of bleeding. Okay, So don't be afraid to, if you need to, roll the victim. So that way you could really have a good idea of which wound to attend to. If there are multiple sources of bleeding, pick one. Just pick one. Because it needs your full attention, okay? If possible, pick one that's closest to the torso, okay? If possible, because that's where the bigger vessels are here. If a big bleeding's happening by the toe, but you see gashes here, what, where would you go? This is closest to the heart, right? So you go closest to the torso. Multiple places that bleeding can happen. Okay, also clothing can hide a life-threatening bleed. Okay, there's some people out there who say, it's winter time here now, right, in New England, if you wear those really puffy down jackets, it can absorb a lot of blood. It can be very misleading, right? You may not see a large pool of blood on the ground, but you know this person was like maybe fell from, they may be hiking, and there was, it was very rocky, lots of trees. So don't be afraid to maybe unzip the jacket or take a look, move the victim. So that way, you're able to really best assess. Any questions about that? I'm sorry? Back of a neck injury, how do you know? Well, we don't. You would have to because under this training, under this training, we're looking at the life-threatening bleed. As far as neck injury, back injury, that requires 
testing. That requires x-ray, that requires so many different sophisticated machineries. But yes, if you think that this person might have a spinal cord injury, just do it carefully. Just do it carefully. Roll the victim as one. Don't, don't twist the person. If you can, if you have another person, what we call at the hospital is log roll the victim. Just do your best, just careful. Again, the intention of this program is to stop the bleed. Again, because bleeding, we could bleed to death in minutes. Okay. What about the skull? Because that bleeds a lot the head, right? Yep. Yep. Can, can you stop that bleeding? Mm-hmm. Yep. You apply pressure. Yep. You apply pressure. Yep. 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 Good questions. Okay. So bleeding can happen anywhere in our body, basically arms and legs, neck, armpits, joints, uh, groins, and the whole body. So arms and legs, we call that extremities. That's where the tourniquet comes in handy. And later on, you'll have a chance to practice putting the tourniquet on yourself and another person, okay? So these are our test and training tourniquets. So after you're done, just bring it up to the, to the front here so that way we could use it again for the next training. But this is basically, if you have tourniquets. This is what it looks like. And I'll show the mechanics of that in a few minutes. Those are good for extremities because they can go around your arms or your legs. Now if the wound was in the neck area, armpits, or groin, the tourniquet's not going to work there. Definitely Hand over hand pressure is very important. If the wound was in the torso, just like with that down jacket, it, instead of the blood perhaps leaving the, the body, because we have a body cavity here, the blood may pool inside. So you may not see a pooling of blood on the ground. The blood could possibly be staying in maybe the lungs, the diaphragm, the stomach area, the cavity. That's very serious here. So when you call 911 and you see that there is a wound, a big wound there in the body cavity, you let them know because that's a big emergency right there. Big, big, big. So compress pressure. Apply direct pressure over the wound. Hand over hand pressure. Focus on the location of the bleeding. Use enough gauze or cloth to cover the injury. If pressure stops the bleeding, keep the pressure on the wound until helps arrive. So cloth. Remember I said that I was, I, I was doing this program for the mass dot and they work with a lot of oily machineries. Oily rags can be used for, to control the bleed. You could use it to stuff the bleeding. So remember also the, remember also the shark bite victim, right? The nurses on the, at the beach, they used you know, towels. Some of them are sandy towels. You could still use that, okay? Don't worry about infection. Don't worry about the cleanliness of the cloth that you're going to use to stuff the wound. Because when that person arrives to the ER, that's when the person's going to be getting antibiotics. That's one of the medications I can assure you that they will be getting besides maybe blood, IV fluids, antibiotics because you need to prevent that infection, okay? Again, our job as bystanders is to stop the bleed. Once the person goes to the ER, they do their own job. Control the, the bleeding, medicate the person for pain. Give the person antibiotics to prevent infection. Take the person to the OR to fix whatever needs to be fixed. 
Okay, so our job lies in controlling the bleeding. Any questions about that? If you, um, if you don't have like cloth available, do you have like paper towels? Paper towels is good. Socks, your socks, their socks. Newspaper, not so much because it's kind of like, you want to be able to have it so that the cloth itself can really get into the nooks and crannies. Yeah, so that's actually a good, good, um, good question. But if you have a diaper, if you have maxi pads, depends, um, scarf, hat, okay, paper towels, tissues. All right, so here is just a short video that shows how, let me see if it works. Oh, okay. So this person's using a t-shirt. And she's just showing the mechanics of hand over hand pressure here. Okay. So hand over hand. So when you do, for those of you who are trained in CPR, remember how we're supposed to compress. We're supposed to compress. We're supposed to act as the pump for the heart that stopped working. So we are pumping that CPR. But for stop the bleed, we just want to apply pressure. Okay? And when you apply pressure, make sure you're, you want to take care of your back. Your body mechanics is very important. Does anybody here have any weak back? or bad back. <laughs> Sometimes I do. <laughs> so when you have to do anything, apply pressure, you want to get as close to the person as possible. And then so that way, when you put your hand over hand pressure on the actual wound, you're able to lean in. Okay, you're not using your strength because if I was to do this, I'm, my, the force of my pressure is this way, and plus I'm starting to use the strength of my arms and also straining my back. My center of gravity is off. I won't be able to help this victim much longer than a few minutes. So get as close to the victim as possible, hand over hand pressure, lean in, okay? Do you need me to show that here? So we're just leaning in. Hand over hand, and you lean in. All right, so if the wound is deep, if the wound is deep, applying pressure over the wound is not going to cut it, really, literally. <laughs> it's not going to <laughs> take care of the bleeding um, that's happening underneath. It's because a wound can be this deep, right? Mm -hmm. See that space there? If you apply pressure, there's still bleeding that's happening inside these walls, muscle walls. So you want to be able to pack it. And the way to pack it is, again, if you don't have any gauze, whatever absorb, absorbent cloth or substance that you have is very, very helpful. So what you want to do is you want to be able to thread it through. And as you're going in, you're trying to figure out, okay, how deep is this? What am I working with in there? How deep is that? Is it going straight down? Is it, is it going this way? Is it going that way? Can I feel any bones? If, there, if you're packing an area that you think might have a broken bone there, be extra careful because bones are sharp like broken glass. You don't want to cut yourself, okay? So you want to keep packing until you can't pack any longer. So the packing adds pressure along the linings of the muscle wall. Okay. So 
what it, we should not do is if you have a gauze and you feel like, okay, I can pack. I have a gauze. This is good. I'm just going to shove this in there. No. <laughs> First of all, you're not going to be able to put the whole thing in there, and you may not be able to get to the, the, the depth of the uh, actual wound. So you want to be able to thread it in there, okay? Just like this person's doing, slowly. Eventually have this. It's filled. As opposed to just taking the gauze and putting it on top. Do you see the blood pooling there? Yeah. So that's a different way of applying pressure. Once you are done packing, then you could put hand over hand pressure to stop the bleeding, okay? He's using a quick clot gauze that has a special compound in it to really help stop the bleed. It helps the wound clot. And he is just, you know, he's threading it in there. He's not taking the whole thing and just putting it in there a little bit at a time. And as you're doing that, just be sure to know Look, what are you dealing with? How deep is it? Are you going to need another gauze? Or is that enough? You see how he applied pressure over that, okay? Okay, so packing, you could do packing pretty much anywhere in the body. The torso, again, we just don't know the extent of the bleeding that's happening in the body cavity. Definitely, that's a medical emergency. But here in these areas, you could definitely pack, okay? If you don't have a tourniquet, you could have, you could pack, okay? Because not too many people have a tourniquet. How many people have a tourniquet? Yeah, so it's not really a common practice. But hopefully, after this training, you're maybe inspired to buy a tourniquet. But the only thing is, once you have a tourniquet and you use it on somebody, that tourniquet goes with that person. You don't get it back. Can you buy those at CVS? Um, I'll tell you what the, uh, what's recommended because there's many, since this training has happened, there's many different types of tourniquets. There's some that's not as good as others. So this one is called a CAT tourniquet, combat application tourniquet, which is recommended by the military. That's what they use. But I'll, there's others um, that I'll show you in later slides. And if you are going to decide to buy a tourniquet, make sure you, I have one in my car, I have one at home. Will a good first aid kit have the gauze? Gauze? Yeah, the you, would have to, you would have to take a look at the contents because there are different types of first aid kits there. Um, at the end, this is from the Quincy Health Department. This is a little first aid kit. It has band-aids in there, and also an alcohol swab and an uh, antibiotic ointment, which is really cool. Um, I don't think it has a gauze. No, but it's very portable. You can put it in your purse or your glove compartment. So remind me at the end, everybody gets one. Here, you could have one of these. This is a small stop the bleed kit. Basically, the bigger the kit, the more you know the contents are in there, right? Mm -hmm. Just take a look what you have. Uh, or you can just get one of those shaving kits and you create your own kit, which is cheaper, okay? Gloves, they're more accessible these days because of COVID, you know? And uh, yeah, so just make sure that you have ones that you could use and you know where it is. Again, I have a tourniquet at home. I have one in my car because I decided if I have one at home, but what if I'm driving somewhere and I see an incident, it's at home. <laughs> so it's, you know, just trying to cover the bases. And if you do have it, just make sure, and if you live with somebody, let them know where it is in case they need to use it for themselves or on you. Okay, so tourniquet. Tourniquet is different from uh, the wound, I mean from uh, packing. Because when you're using the hand over hand pressure, you're putting your hand over hand right over the wound. 
directly over the wound, okay, to stop it from bleeding. But the tourniquet, you apply the tourniquet not over the wound, but two to three inches above the wound. So if my wound here, my arm here, I would put the tourniquet here. But if the bend of my elbow is here, you don't want to put a tourniquet at your, your knees or your elbows. So you'd go above, okay? Okay, don't place over the knee or elbow. Tighten the tourniquet until the bleeding stops and don't remove the tourniquet. What I haven't said yet is when you are applying pressure, <clears throat> whether it's just a, a superficial wound but still needs a you know hand over hand pressure, or packing, or tourniquet, you don't want to remove your hand. You don't want to check to see, oh, is that working? <laughs> Am I doing it right? <laughs> because the moment you release your pressure, whether it's your hand over hand or you removing the, the packing or you loosening up the tourniquet, guess what's going to happen? You're going to undo what you just did. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, just to create a more realistic um, scene, there's a, say there's an incident, maybe a rollover, and you see a victim on the ground, and you feel that you can help, and it's safe. You call 911, and you, know, you see this person. Would this person be singing, and would they be happy? You know, they might be in excruciating pain. They might be disoriented. They might have been in shock and just don't know what's going on. So it could be a little loud. Okay, they could be scared and screaming. They could be in a lot of pain too. They could be screaming. And so for anybody, a stranger, to come up to them and say, I'm here to help you. I've been trained to you know, recognize life-threatening bleed. And then all of a sudden, you're putting pressure over the area that hurts. Would they like you so much? Mm -hmm. Maybe not. <laughs> so just let them know what you're doing before you do it. I'm, I'm applying pressure. I'm, I'm sorry it hurts. I've called 911, and I'm really sorry that this is hurting you, but I just need to control your, your bleeding. Okay? So just, you know, just be prepared for a scenario where they could be screaming at you, swearing. Don't take it personally. They could be swinging at you because you're really hurting them. They want you to get off. But just kind of, again, be prepared for any type of scenarios. Be prepared for any type of scenarios. Again, if it's a roll over and you see a woman or maybe a man on the ground and you see maybe the car had a car seat, okay, so you only see this adult. Just ask the adult, are you here with somebody? I see a car seat. Oh, yeah, my child, okay? You don't see a child. Where did that child go? So your priority is to save the bleeding, but as you're doing that, try to keep an eye out for that little person, the child. And try to get information from that person. Are you, are you heading home? Uh, do you live nearby? What's the name of your child? You know, what's your name? Because this person, by the time EMS arrives, maybe they might have passed out. And it's good for you to be able to offer some sort of an information for EMS. Okay, does that make sense? Okay. You can apply the tourniquet to others or on yourself. You can apply it over clothes, but use your common sense. During the winter time, we have layers and layers and layers, right? And you don't want to be able to put a tourniquet on somebody that has a really puffy jacket, who has three layers of sweaters and jackets and then the jacket. It's not really going to apply the pressure that you want it to do. So you, if you can, try to remove or cut, cut. The, clo the clothing, so that way you could apply the tourniquet appropriately to that, to that part of the body. And yes, tourniquets hurt, you know? So for our, us who have gotten our blood pressure taken before, you know how when the nurse or the technician just keeps, you know, after a while it's like, oh, that hurts. Eventually they release it so they can get your blood pressure reading, but a tourniquet 
once you get the blood, the bleeding under control, the tourniquet stays there. And it does, it's going to hurt. And they say here, if you think that the first tourniquet is not taking care of the bleeding, and if you happen to have a second one, use it. So the second one you would use above the first one. Don't release the first one, use the second one above the first. Does that make sense? So you're This is just uh, a little video about how to use a tourniquet. So the tourniquet has gone around and there's a rod that's called the windlass rod. You keep turning it like a faucet, so that way the water, like you think faucet, you want to turn it off. And then you want the windlass rod to, to get, stay into that clasp, so that way it doesn't unravel. Okay, and then you complete the actual, um, you know, the, the tourniquet, wrapping it around. And if you have a marker, a pen, or a pencil, write down the time. So that way you remember what time it was actually applied. Okay, uh, because during an emergency, time just, there's no concept of time, right? It's just like, you don't know. You, it could have been you know, a half hour, but you just think it was just happened a few minutes ago. So if you can, try to write down the time. Okay, the only thing that I need to add, or want to add with this um, video is, when if you do decide to have a tourniquet, buy one, um, try it, you know, work with it, know how it works, but also have it in a ready position. Have the end already threaded through the buckle. Because again, seconds count. And if you're nervous, and I gotta use the target, that's in my bleeding's there, oh my god. And you can't, it's like putting the, the thread through the needles. <laughs> you don't wanna waste that time. You don't want to waste that time. You want it to be ready. You want to be ready. Okay, so that way all you have to do is put it around that hand. That. Here. And then you turn the rod. Wind last rod. You turn it like a faucet. And you see if you don't let it go underneath the clasp here, it's just going to unravel. So that's the purpose of this. Okay. You want to turn, 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 turn. I can't see that good. I need help later. What's that? I can't see that good, so I have to have help. I'll yeah, yeah, later. yeah. And that's actually a very good point. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Okay, so there, and then there's the white strap right there. Okay. For those of you who can't see that well, or be, can't really maneuver, a tourniquet because of arthritis or maybe carpal tunnel or trigger fingers or you know whatever it is or maybe you just don't have a tourniquet remember applying pressure the old-fashioned way hand over hand pressure that'll take care of it okay yeah, some people, that's a common question. How can they use a belt? So belts only have a certain amount of holes in there, okay? So you don't want to be wasting time trying to, like, leather belt. There's only a certain amount of holes, right? So it's not going to apply the pressure that you want. If you don't have a tourniquet, use your two hands, hand over hand pressure over the site. Okay. Could you put the tourniquet out too tight and cause any harm? No. No, no, yeah, yep. You know that the tourniquet is working when the bleeding has stopped, okay? You know that it's working when the bleeding has stopped. And if the person says, oh my gosh, it hurts so much, you're killing me. You're trying to save their life, but it feels like they're killing them because of the pain. Can you release it? Can you release the tourniquet? Just give me a few minutes break. Would you do that? No, no. no. because you're going to, Yes, yes, you're going to undo the bleeding. So you, you just 
take their mind off of the pain, distract them. Let's take some nice deep breaths. Breathe with me. Do breathing exercises with the victim because it's going to calm you down and it's going to calm down the person too. Okay, so just distraction. You know, what's your name? You know, do you live around here? What do you do for work? Are you from the area? Who else is with you? Okay, where's your phone? You know, so that way the phone is near the person in case they need to call. So any questions about this video? Oh, that's a good question. If your wound packing was really good and the bleeding has stopped, remember the idea is to stop the bleeding. And that means your wound packing was good. You'd still apply pressure. But if you feel that, okay, I packed the wound, but boy, my body's getting tired. Oh, my knees are killing me. You know, I would apply a tourniquet, but still stay with that person. Yeah. Uh, so remember, with tourniquets, you don't apply it over the wound. You apply it two to three inches above. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the packing itself is applying pressure to the lining of the muscles. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, you know, just be as creative as you can be. But again, the whole idea is to stop the bleeding. So for those of you who's wondering what kind of tourniquets are recommended, because again, there's many different types now. What we're using in the training is the CAT tourniquet, combat application tourniquet. When you buy it, it can either come in black or bright orange, like fluorescent orange. The blue ones are just meant for training, okay? And then there's the soft T, the SAM XT, the TX3, TMT, and RMT. But if you don't have a tourniquet, what would you use? Your hands. Yes, yes, yes. If you have bad hands, again, bad wrists, another person from the other um, workshop, they said, how about your knee? Can you use that? Yeah. Or your elbow, can you use that? Yeah. Is it applying pressure? Are you going to be able to stay in that position? So apply pressure. More recommended. OK, so bleeding control in children. Bleeding control in children. All in all but extremely young child, the same tourniquet used for adults can be used for children. I have three boys. My youngest is 17, and he's this tall. And he's like an, he's an adult size. So he, hopefully he doesn't need it, he can benefit from a tourniquet should he happen to need it. But he has friends who are smaller framed. And putting a tourniquet around their arm is not going to take care of it. You see how there's, it has to be greater than this diameter. If their arms are like this, then this is not going to help. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So what would you apply? What type of pressure? Hand, hand over hand. Very good. <laughs> good listener. Thank you. All right. So um, for infants or very small children, tourniquets are too big. So direct pressure on the wound, as directed previously, will work in virtually all cases. So nothing like our hands to apply the pressure. But once again, unlike CPR, we're not pumping, right? or just applying pressure. For a large, deep wounds, wound packing can be performed in children, just as in adults using the same technique as previously described. So again, when you're packing, you're packing. After you're done packing, you still put pressure over the wound, okay? You're still putting pressure over the wound. So frequently asked questions, what happens if a person was impaled? What happens? So it's like a big windy day, and here a big branch fell right on top of me, and I have this big branch going through me. You would leave it there. You'd leave it there. It looks gruesome. It looks painful. But what happens if you take out that 
big branch, it's, it'll start bleeding. So in a weird way, that branch is applying pressure to the lining. Even though it created a big wound, life-threatening wound, when you take it out, there's going to be that space that was created by that branch. So you need to leave it in there. Stay with that person, make sure that whatever object it is is stable, nobody trips over it, and you know, that person's not moving around, should they like, pass out? So improvised tourniquet, like the belts, it's very common. Um, we suggest, again, don't use any improvised tourniquets, use your hand over hand pressure, okay? That is within the, um, the principle of this program. Loss of an arm or a limb. Uh, there's an accident, boom, somebody's arm is on the ground. They're bleeding. You apply pressure over the wound, okay? So just let the EMS people know. Like, oh, I, you know, I've been applying pressure. I see a leg there. You know, the, your job is to take care of the bleeding, okay? Because again, if you waste time trying to get to the leg to save it, in the meantime, the actual person is bleeding to death. So just, you know, attend to the life-threatening bleed. Pain. Once again, it's painful. Very painful for the individual. Very painful. So let them know that when EMS arrives, when help arrives, they'll be able to be given medications. And they will be given medications for their pain. In the meantime, what you have to offer to them is your presence, your calming presence, your skill, okay? And just being there for them. Being there for them. Just, it's so, so important. Other questions? When you talk about um, loss of an arm or a leg, your meaning from the top, right? It could be anywhere. It could be here. But what if, if you uh, were to lose it here, then wouldn't you put your tourniquet up here? Mm hmm Yep. You put the tourniquet above the wound site. Yep. 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 If this part here was re removed, I'd put the pressure here. You put pressure yep. here. Put the pressure right there. Yep. Yep, yep, yep. Very good question. Very good question. Any other questions? Okay. If, if, uh, if I that in the answer out there, you don't have a tourniquet, you put this in the You'd have to put pressure, yeah, as much pressure as you can. Yeah. Yeah, if you have, if you, don't get grossed out, this is a fake hand. Okay, here we go. <laughs> but if this hand was to come off, <laughs> I would put pressure right there, the best you can. Okay, and you should know, you'll know that you're doing a good job with the pressure if the bleeding stops. stops. Yes, again, our job is to stop the bleeding, okay? Yes, it might be painful, might be painful, but um, yeah, you apply pressure there. Let me put my hand back in place. <laughs> Surgery. <laughs> so in summary, personal safety, again, or so the whole training is about saving an individual. But it's very important to save yourself, OK? And also, you could be the one with a life-threatening bleed. What if you're going down the stairs and you trip and you fall and you land on something hard? You need to be able to do something about it, right? So knowing what to do, applying, what do you apply? Pressure. Okay. And then A stands for? Alert 911. B is? Bleeding. bleeding. Finding the biggest source of bleeding, because there could be multiple ones. Compression. Add pressure, or you pack. But the packing is pressure. Compress with a tourniquet. Again, a different form of pressure, and then wait for help to arrive. Okay. All right, and if you need more information, this is the website to go to. All right, so that concludes the presentation portion of the training, so now we'll do the hands-on training. Okay, and for those of you who are watching this, please be sure to complete your training by going to an in-person program. So that way you're fully certified to do this training and you're able to, you know, 
know how to use a tourniquet on yourself and others and also to pack. All right.